This is Olive Kittredge by Elizabeth Strout, and I just think it's a marvellous book. I read it during the first lockdown in 2020, and it kept me very good company. It's a marvellous book. Olive's a teacher, a maths teacher in a high school, uh, coming to the end of her career and about to retire, and she lives in a small town, a fictional town called Crosby, uh, which is situated in Maine on the eastern coast of the United States. And the, it's a small community, and there's a lovely sense of community in this book. There's also a lovely sense of living by the sea, uh, the, the, the seagulls and the ozone and the white horses on the little waves in the bay. They all creep into stories, but they're not cliched. They're, they're fresh, and you can smell it and feel it and feel that sun. So the, it, it's written beautifully in all sorts of ways, but it mainly centres around this fantastic character, Olive Kitteridge. She's a big woman um, uh, physically and, and she's also a big presence sometimes and she's a complex character. She's not very nice sometimes, in fact she's really awful sometimes, but also she can be incredibly kind and uh, save the day um, when you know other, other people uh, don't know what to do or don't do the right thing, she instinctively does. The, the structure of this book is very strange. It's written as, I think it's 13 chapters or stories and in one sense it's like a book of short stories but in another sense it isn't. Olive is the main character in some of these stories she's in the forefront and the action revolves around her but other times she's quite peripheral but still important so um, at the other end of the extreme there's one story where there are two young women talking and the, st and the story's all about their lives and what's going on there but at one stage they just say one to the other, do you remember what Mrs Kitteridge used to say to us when we were back in school? She used to say, blah, blah, blah. And what Olive had said to them had stayed with them and been influential in important ways in their lives. So Olive is a strong character in that story, although she only takes up a couple of lines and has nothing else to do with, ostensibly, to do with the plot. So it's very clever the way Olive is phased into these different stories. Um, very, very clever. I'm going to read a bit now, just to introduce Olive. Um, in this story, it's the second one in the book, there's a young man who'd grown up in the, in the town, he'd gone off to New York, and he'd come back and he's actually sitting, looking out over the bay in his car, with a rifle, contemplating suicide. Um, and uh, he hears a knock on the car window. Kevin Coulson, hello. He nodded. You're going to invite me to sit in your car? His hands made fist in his lap. He started to shake his head. No, I, I'm only... But she'd let herself in. A big woman, taking up the whole bucket seat, her knees close to the dashboard. She hauled a big black handbag across her lap. What brings you here? She said. He looked out towards the water. The young woman was moving back up from the dock. The seagulls were screeching furiously behind her, beating their large wings and darting down. She'd have been throwing out clamshells, most likely. Visiting, Mrs Kittredge prompted. From New York City? Isn't that where you live now? Jesus, Kevin said quietly. Does everybody know everything? Oh, sure, she said, comfortably. What else is there to do? <laughs> In the opening story, we meet Olive and we meet her husband, Henry, who runs the local pharmacy. And he's a mild-mannered, nice chap, um, quite dull, uh, but tries to do the decent thing. He employs a young female assistant and becomes quite infatuated with her. And the, it, the first chapter is just beautiful. It's... It, it's sad you can feel Henry's lease of life that this the presence of this young woman has given him you can you hear you feel uh, Olive's anger um, and it's both incredibly sad for both of them and also really quite funny in just how uh, how pathetic really both of them are around this incident but it's a good introduction to the the, the funny and the sad and the complex nature of uh, of this book. I suppose I would say that, that that's not a, 
an unusual premise for a short story. And yet Strout deals with all those things without cliché and without kind of falling into the standard tropes around that kind of story. They have a son, Christopher, and he, he ages th through the book. Um, and he, he's in, in one of the chapters, he's getting married and he's met a... A, a young, who's a very smart woman, professional, organised. Um, she's everything that Olive isn't, really. And she's going to whisk uh, Christopher, the son, away to California to live, so on the other side of the country. And the chapter's about the wedding. And at the wedding, uh, Olive overhears her new daughter-in-law talking to a friend, and they're laughing about the dress that Olive's been wearing to, to the wedding. And it's a dress she'd made herself, and she'd taken a lot of care over it and was, was very proud of it and fond of it. And, and Olive's incensed and she lies on the bed just feeling awful and angry. Um, and in, in the room that she's in, it's the room that her son's room, and uh, her new daughter-in-law has moved her clothes in there. And uh, this little bit uh, shows Olive's character in a different way. Olive walks to the closet, pulls open the door. The dress is there, make her feel violent though. She wants to snatch them down, twist the expensive dark fabric of these small dresses hanging pompously on wooden hangers. And there are sweaters, different shades of brown and green, folded neatly on a plastic quilted hanging shelf. One of them, near the bottom, is actually beige. For God's sake! What's wrong with a bit of colour? Olive's fingers shake because she's angry and because anyone, of course, will, could walk in right now and stick his head through the open door. The beige sweater is thick and this is good because it means the girl won't wear it until fall. Olive unfolds it quickly and smears a black line of magic marker down one arm. Then she holds the marker in her mouth and refolds the sweater hurriedly folding it again and even again to get it as near as it was at first. But she manages. You would never, opening this closet door, know that somebody had poured through it. Everything's so neat. Except for the shoes. All over the floor of the closet, shoes are tossed and scattered. Olive chooses a dark, scuffed loafer that looks as though it's worn frequently. In fact, Olive has often seen Suzanne wearing these loafers, Having bagged her husband, Olive supposes, she can now flop around in beaten up shoes. Bending over, scared for a moment that she won't get up, Olive pushes the loafer down inside her handbag. And then, hoisting herself up, she does get up, panting slightly, and arranges the tin foil wrapped package of blueberry cake so that it covers the shoe. <laughs> Awful. Awful behaviour. But what I should have said with the first quote I read about the young man in the car and with the shotgun, she does actually, her presence uh, saves the day and, and the young man doesn't shoot himself as a result of his, uh, his interactions with Olive. So she has all sorts of um, effects on the people she meets. I'll read a little bit more. Um, I'll read a couple more bits. Uh, this is a bit later on and... Um, it's just uh, a, a paragraph in one of the chapters uh, when Olive's uh, reflecting about her son. Her son, Christopher, had married. Olive and Henry had been appalled by the bossy bossiness of their new daughter-in-law, who had grown up in Philadelphia and who expected things like a diamond tennis bracelet for Christmas. What was a tennis bracelet? But Christopher had bought her one and who would send back meals in a restaurant, one time demanding the chef be brought to speak to her. Olive, suffering a seemingly endless menopause, would be washed over with extraordinary waves of heat in the girl's presence. And one time, Suzanne said, There's a soy supplement you could take, Olive, if you don't believe in oestrogen replacement. Olive thought, I believe in minding my own business, that's what I believe in. So she has a terribly difficult, tangled relationship, not only with Christopher, but uh, I suppose she has a, a more straightforward relationship with her new daughter-in-law, which is that she doesn't like her. 
This is part of what I wrote about this book after my first reading. Stripes' observations of couples, their behaviour, conversation, contentedness and quiet desperation are stunningly convincing. Her wit is sharp, sometimes cruel, but at other times incredibly sympathetic. Olive herself is brilliant, big, clumsy and pushing the world away. Strike manages to make her a person who evokes sympathy, pity sometimes, but then admiration. We're forced to recognise the bits of Olive in ourselves. There's loads more in here. I can't recommend it highly enough. Uh, there's also a very, very good podcast on BBC's World Book Club, uh, where, Olive, uh, where Elizabeth Strout takes questions and talks about the book, takes questions from readers around the world. I found that very interesting. I've also listened to that twice, as well as having read the book twice in the last year. Uh, so this, this, this book has uh, been a big part of my recent past. <laughs>